Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all. Young adults, got to love them. Rowdy. Friends, it is my joy to be sharing with you out of 1 Samuel this morning. And uh, as I was reading through what we were reading in the devotionals this week, I was really struck by how many crazy stories there are just in these few first chapters. I was talking to my wife. I'm like, I don't even know what, what, how do you choose? I even have David and Goliath. But we're not going to talk about David and Goliath this morning, unfortunately, because you guys know the story, right? You know David and Goliath. In fact, I bet you know the Bible really well. But, you know, I heard a joke. I heard a joke this week. You guys humor me a little bit with a joke. It's summer, right? These two guys, these two friends, they're walking along talking about the Bible and so one guy knows a lot more about the Bible than his other friend does. He's like, you know, I bet you, you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. I bet you 20 bucks you don't know the Lord's Prayer. And the other guy says, oh, that's easy. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die, this is such a morbid prayer. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And the other guy just starts laughing at him, reaches in his pocket, gives him 20 bucks, said, I didn't think you knew it. (laughs) Now, that's none of you, of course. You know, we set out on this journey through the Bible because one of the most important things for the disciple is to know what God says, what he thinks, and what he's like. And you can't just do that through your experiences. You have to hear the voice of the Lord. You have to know him through the word. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is, this generation that is alive on the earth today is the most heavily informed generation to come around or come along ever. We have more access to educational resources than any other generation ever. Yet, I'll tell you this, we are the most biblically illiterate generation to come around ever, in a long time at least. There were actually other generations where there was, there was no word of God in the hands of the people. We're actually going to chat about that briefly later. But we have access to the Bible 24-7 in any language you want to attempt to read it in, any version you could think of, and yet we know so little about the Bible. And I would actually venture to say that it's very difficult to walk uprightly with God if you don't know what he cares about. And that's why we are marching through the high-level story of the entire Bible as it leads us to Jesus and then shows us how to live as his disciples so that we can know him. And in knowing him, we can make him known to our neighbors and to the nations. You guys ready for that? How many people in here are in those Bible devos, those daily devos? Let's see it. If you're not in there, go to the YouVersion Bible app on your phone and search for part six. Are we in part six now? Somebody correct me. We're in part five. Just kidding. We just are finishing part six. We'll reel that back. We're in part five. You won't find part six yet. And jump in right where we're at because every day you're going to get a snippet of God's story and it will encourage you. Okay. All right, let's pray. Oh, guys, Pastor Jason's on vacation this week, so let's go nuts, all right? Oh, he's good. That's good. Jesus, we want to say thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you did not leave us alone, but you sent the counselor to be with us. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Come. Do everything that you want to do in our hearts. Use us. We are, help us to learn how to set ourselves aside to be people who are about your kingdom work. I thank you for every family in this house. We ask you, God, that you would bless us with a sense of your presence, a nearness of your voice, and courage to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as we jump in as well, I want to welcome all of our viewers online. We're so glad that you're here out there on YouTube land and on the website. It's great to see you guys. Now, you might remember that we were in Ruth last week, 
Pastor Jason destroyed all your fantasies about Boaz and Ruth and brought you down to reality. But the thing I love about that story, the way that he presented it to you, is way more accurate to how the situation really was. And not only that, in bringing in the human element of who these people were and the decisions that they made and the advice that they gave, it actually elevates and glorifies God. Do you see what I mean? Because this wasn't just some hyper-spiritual human being doing something because they were just so spiritual. These were humans doing their best, and God intervened and came to be a part of that process and brought glory for his name out of it. It is awesome. And so, as we move from Ruth now and the time of the judges, we're actually moving into a new season biblically. We had the patriarchs through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we had the judges. There's 12 of them. And now we're moving into the period of the kings. And you're going to hear a lot of history over the next couple weeks and months as we go through what God was doing in the kingdom, in his kingdom in Israel, through the kings and through the different enemies that oppressed them. So remember, the situation from Judges and Ruth was pretty dire. You guys remember the statement that was repeated over and over again? There was no king in the land. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Remember this? And in this situation, we find a woman named Hannah. She's the wife of a guy named Elkanah. Sounds like a Star Wars name or something. It's kind of cool. Um, but she's barren and she cannot have a child. Now, keep in mind, contextually in the history here, you would see someone who was barren would consider that a great shame because having children was like the greatest honor. So here we are, we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1, 11 through 17, and it says, And she vowed, she was at the temple, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, Eli was the priest in the temple at the time. He observed her mouth and Hannah was speaking in her heart, and only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, being a good priest, took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Great question, Eli. Way to be compassionate. Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. This woman, Hannah, I'm sure she was slightly offended at being called a drunken woman, but I want to point out something just real basic. This is like a free side note for you. Eli was accustomed to seeing people acting in worthless manners. In fact, his children were called worthless sons. Why? Because they did not know the Lord and they dishonored him in front of the people. Eli was judging this woman based on what he was accustomed to seeing even in himself and his own sons. And I want to encourage you that as you walk and as you mature in Jesus Christ, the temptation is to be judgmental of other people's walk. Judgment doesn't draw people closer to Jesus. Do you realize that? I don't know the last time I felt encouraged by being judged by someone. Now, Eli could have, could have asked a different kind of question. He could have asked, are you okay? Instead of, how long will you go on being a drunkard, you worthless person? So this is my little, a little sidebar for you. Let us be cautious and careful about how we apply 
what we see, how we interpret that. Because the general way that we judge one another is from our standpoint, from what we know and from what we are accustomed to. But let us not be like an Eli, because you'll see later if you keep reading this story, Eli was not a great priest. He was not a great father. In fact, I think he was a little bit of a coward because his sons were doing things that should not be done in the face of Israel and in the face of the Lord, and he did nothing about it. He did not defend God's reputation or God's name before the people. Fast forward, you see this crazy guy, David. Some Philistine was mocking God, and he rose up and killed him. Why? To defend the honor of the Lord. And so let us not be like an Eli, sitting around casting judgment on others based on what we think, based on our own experiences. But let us be people who hear the voice of the Lord. So Hannah, she goes away. She has a conversation with her husband, and her husband says, Am I not worth more than 10 sons to you? And Hannah probably said, I mean, you are, but you're not at the same time. Fast forward, the Lord gives her a son. After she weans him, she brings him back to the temple. His name is Samuel. She named him Samuel because the name means the Lord hears. She brings him to the temple and puts him under the care of Eli. Now, side note, would you put one of your kids under the mentorship, in the mentorship program of a guy like Eli? I wouldn't. But see, what she was doing is she was thinking beyond the physical that she could see and entrusting him not to Eli, but to the Lord, because that was her vow. Another little side note. <laughs> Give your children to the Lord. Wherever they go, give them to the Lord and trust them to him. In the middle of this, there's Samuel, about 12 years old. And it says in 1 Samuel 2.26, now the young man, Samuel, continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And picking up right in chapter 3, we're going to read a big chunk this morning. I hope you guys are ready for that. It says, Now the young man, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. He was just hanging out in God's presence. Then the Lord called Samuel and said, and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you have called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and he lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Another version of this says that he had not yet heard the voice of God, and he had no experience with the voice of the Lord. Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Good job, Eli. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and calling at as, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel in which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, 
I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Yeah, no wonder. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he has told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what, he, what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of of the Lord. This 12 year old prophet became a leader in Israel. And you know that he goes on to not just prophesy, but he anoints Israel's first king and second king, Saul and David, according to the word of the Lord and the pleas of the people for a king. This man heard and obeyed God's words. So what do these stories tell us about God? This, let's just remind you, the, the people, the characters in these stories are not people you necessarily want to model your life after all the time. Most of them are not great people. In fact, the majority of the kings we're going to read about are horrible individuals who you would never want to look to their life as an example of how to live. But beyond just being reactionary and saying, well, don't live like that and don't live like that, a question you can ask when you're reading scriptures like these is to say, what does this say about God? And what does this say about us and our response to God? As I was looking through these stories, I felt the Lord highlight one major theme. And I'll tell you this, that God is unique among the gods of the world. Of the major religions on the earth or worldviews on the earth today, you have this. You've got Buddhism. They believe there is no God. The goal is to cease to exist and stop reincarnating oneself. In Hinduism, they have infinite gods. Not just a few, not just a thousand, but infinite gods. And they talk to them, but they do not talk back. In Islam, they believe in one God, and they speak to him, but they never expect a reply, and they certainly don't want to make him angry. In New Age, you have this idea that we are God. Well, that's a scary thought, because that means you're seeking yourself for wisdom and understanding. The answer lies within you, young Jedi. <laughs> that's probably my last Star Wars thing. I'm not even a Star Wars guy. It just came out. Sorry. <clears throat> Imagine that, though. How hopeless is that? I need some advice. Mark, what do you think about that? Well, I, I don't know still. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> now, here's the cool thing. Christianity, our God listens and he speaks to us. This is completely unique on the planet. Do you recognize that? It's kind of very unique in the world religion scheme of things. You don't have this situation very often where a belief system says, not only can I talk to my God, my God speaks to me. Our God is a relational God and he wants to communicate with his kids. It's a two-way relationship. And you see this throughout the entire story of the Bible. This is how it was meant to be at the very beginning. God wanted to walk with us and have relationship with us and talk with us and hear what was on our mind and see what we thought about elephants and giraffes and rhinoceroses and all kinds of cool stuff. He wanted and has always wanted relationship with us that is two-way, where he hears what's in our heart and we hear what's in his. Now, sin got in the way of that. 
So what did he have to do? He carved out a people for himself and then he brought prophets into their midst and he spoke through those prophets. And then he brought kings into there and mixed them with and had prophets alongside of them to rule their people. But it was not always like this. And I believe in Jesus Christ, we now have the open door and the freedom to have a relationship with God, one where we speak to him and he speaks to us. Now, I presume that everyone in this room, you, you know Jesus. You know him. Do you talk to him? Do you let him talk to you? Samuel was a man who spoke to God and heard from God and acted on the word of God. Did you catch what it said there? That God did not let a single one of his words drop to the ground. Why? Because he spoke the words of God. There's this thing called divine revelation where God reveals something about himself through the word and through us hearing about him. We could call it in today's common language, hearing God's voice. It is a practice that is millennia. It's a millennia long practice. Hearing God's voice, listening and obeying what he says. Samuel heard that first instance when Samuel heard, he didn't recognize God's voice. But through practice and obedience, he learned to hear the voice of God clearly. But the question is, like, how does God speak today? I put together a short list. You guys ready? God speaks quietly like he did to Elijah. God speaks loudly like he did at Mount Sinai. He speaks through creation as we see in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and Psalm 19. He speaks through others. He speaks through angels. He even speaks through non-believers. Think about this. Samuel learned that that was the voice of the Lord through a crooked priest. God used a crooked priest to introduce Samuel to what his voice sounded like. He also speaks through dreams. He speaks through visions. He speaks through prophecy. He speaks to our thoughts, to our heart. He speaks through supernatural manifestations like Saul who became Paul because of a revelation of Jesus on the road to Damascus when he got knocked off his donkey and Jesus stepped into the road and was like, hey, why are you persecuting me? He speaks through burning bushes like with Moses. He even spoke through a donkey with Balak. That gives pastors a lot of hope, by the way. If we're ever feeling like anxious or nervous, we just remember God can use a donkey. He can use me too. That's great. I have that tattooed on my side, actually. No, I don't. <clears throat> God speaks audibly sometimes. We see this throughout the Bible. I've met people who claim they're like, I feel like God spoke to me and warned me. And then I went this way and this happened. And it was crazy. So I've never heard God's voice audibly. The main way God speaks to me is through a sense of knowing his voice. Right? Maybe you do as well. You know how God speaks to you. Another way that God speaks is through what we would call a word of knowledge, where he drops something in your mind about a situation that you, you don't know anything about, but he gives it to you. One time my, my papa and I were working on a 1963 GMC pickup truck with a wooden flatbed that had been rusting away in our back you know, area in New Hampshire, or the backyard, and he was teaching me how to fix the brakes. Well, I think I was like 12 years old or something, and we're out there busting our knuckles on these rusty drum brakes and stuff, and we're at the place where we're putting it back together. And we had this piece and we couldn't remember how it went. Well, we had taken all the brakes apart and we didn't have like a template to look at. I don't even think Google was around back then. <laughs> and so we're kind of stuck there. I remember we're both crouched down looking at this brake set up and we got the parts there. And I remember he taught me something. He said, you know, let's pray. God, show us how to put these brakes back together. And we were quiet for a minute and he's like, I think I got it. And he went and put it all back together. I was like, that was amazing. 
God gave us that information that we didn't have to show us what we needed to do and how to do it. And that's happened to me many, 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 many times over my life where God has spoken a word of knowledge to me for someone else, for their edification. And it's probably happened with you as well, I hope. He also speaks through wise counsel. He speaks through the presence of peace. He even speaks through mysteries that you have to wrestle with. Jesus was the master of this. He told stories that no one would understand. And he did it on purpose. He told his disciples, hey, look, I'm telling it like this, not plainly because people who genuinely want to hear and do are going to understand because it's by the Spirit. People who just want to hear so that they can know are not going to understand, and that's the way it's got to be. And his disciples, even his own disciples didn't understand sometimes. What does that say about them? They're like, hey, Jesus, you know you talked about sowing seeds? That's a little complex of a topic for us. Can you maybe unpack why you talked about that? And he's like, oh, my gosh, guys, seriously? You put a seed in the ground, and if it's good soil, it, it cut. you follow what I'm saying? So God uses mysteries sometimes to force us to have to wrestle with him a little. Best advice I ever got about Bible study was stop skipping the, the confusing parts. I don't know about you, but when I was young, in my younger years reading the Bible, I'd be like, reading? That doesn't make sense. Next? Yeah, that makes more sense to me. I'll read that because it makes sense to me. But God sometimes wants you to stop and meditate and think about those mysterious parts and let him reveal himself to you in those. He will also reveal himself through difficulty. Now, before you throw stones at me, God will allow difficulty in our lives because oftentimes it strips away the things that are distracting us and leads us away from those toward him, which is exactly where he wants you to be. Another way that he speaks is through his faithfulness. Because when you see him being faithful, you're like, you are still the same. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And he encourages your faith by testifying of the truth of who he is. Of course, the other way that he speaks is through the Bible itself. Aren't you so grateful that we have this? Not because it just can make us so smart, but it draws us into a knowledge of what he is like. I love the Bible so much. Our family loves the Bible. Not just the book, but who it talks about. And all of these ways that God speaks are through the Holy Spirit for the believer today. So as you approach the Bible to read, I want to encourage you to always whisper a little prayer to the Lord like, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Reveal yourself to me. Because this is not an intellectual process only. This is a spiritual process as we read and learn. So we've got two main concepts of the word in Greek here. The word, word, this is a hard thing to preach on because I'm using the word, word, I'm defining the word, word. The word is the word, you know. We have here logos, which is God's written word, revealed and abiding. Jesus is the logos. He is the word, the revealed word. So this word logos is actually hotly debated in theology class because no one can really land on the exact meaning of this in the English language. But suffice it to say, this is overly simplistic, but this is like his written revealed word, what is already revealed in Christ and in the Bible. We have another word called rema, which is also a word for the word word. Is that good? Am I doing all right? Am I losing you guys yet? Rema is the spoken word or the revealed word that is out. It's on top of what God has already shown in his abiding word. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter's like showing off his literary skills by writing and using both words for the word word. He says this, for you have been born again through the living and abiding word, logos, of God. For all flesh is like grass and its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Logos there as well. And this is the word, Rema, 
which was preached to you, which you heard. This is the cool thing. Your success in hearing God's voice is directly related to your knowledge of the Bible. Why is that? You know, we were teaching um, in a leadership class one time, and the topic of a particular type of sin came up, of being habitual. And we were on it, and we're talking about this is not okay, biblically speaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was the topic of homosexuality. And a girl stood up in the back, and she said, so you're telling me that if someone claims to be a Christian, but they're a practicing homosexual, that you wouldn't allow them to be in this training school? And I said, that's correct. I would want them to go step out, just like any other habitual sin that's got somebody. I would want them to step out, work on that, work it through with Jesus, and then step back in later. And she said, this was a 12-week-long training program. She said, fine, I quit. And I was like, in front of everybody. It was awesome. Not awesome. And I was like, why? why are, and I pressed her for it. Why are you being like this? And she said, well, well, God told me that this sin is okay. And I said, he told you that? Yes, and I know because I felt it. Okay, all right, all right. You heard God tell you that that was okay. All right, then what about what the Bible says? And she said, well, I believe that God's word to me is it always trumps what it says in here because this is old. And I said, I said, well, you know, I think that you're going to have some trouble moving forward, but we'll talk after class. And then she stormed out. <laughs> and she did leave. She did not stay. She was so convinced that the rhema word of God to her had authority over the logos that she had developed a broken theology and a broken worldview and a broken sense of even what is right and wrong. We never do this, though, right? None of us. But I think we do, actually. You see, the rhema word of God will never contradict the written word of God. That's why God gave us the written word of God. Now, you'll hear people all day long say, well, well, that's interpretation, and, and that was for a time, blah, 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 and they'll do whatever they can to manipulate and think. Here's the deal. If you're dealing with somebody like that, just let, the, let their style of life, let their decision-making work itself out to the logical conclusion and be there to love them when things start to fall apart. Do you hear what I'm saying? You see, we have this thing of self-deception, and we will even use the voice of God to reinforce our own deception. This is exactly the situation that Samuel was operating inside of. It is a miracle that this man was able to walk righteously all his life, constantly preaching the word of God to God's people, not one of his words falling to the ground, and he was in the midst of a very crooked generation. Very crooked generation. And we get all upset because we're like, eh, they're doing this. People are saying that. Guys, you have the word of God, the abiding word of God that never fails. In you, in your mouth, to speak it out into your family, into your neighborhood, into this generation. Or, or you could be like an Eli and judge incorrectly, and criticize, and cut people down. I believe God is calling this family, this church family, to be like Samuel's in this generation. That's going to require that you know God in the Word, and that you set the logos above the rhema every time. One of our friends who knows the Bible like really, really well, I mean, he's like 87 years old, so he's had time to read it. He says this, every time he hears from God, he stops and he goes through the entire Bible kind of high level thinking from generous, Genesis to Revelation. And he thinks, does this contradict God's word in any way, what I'm hearing right now? 
And if it doesn't, if it sits well within the context of Scripture, the Logos, he has great peace that he's hearing from God. And I would encourage you that that is how you can test your words that you hear from God as well. Does this point to Jesus, is it edifying, is it loving to those who will hear it or will receive the consequences of my actions? You know, one of the other things that we do as Christians a lot is we uh, will take a scripture out of context. Like when we're in need, we'll quote Philippians, for my God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. And da, da, da. But we forget that that's actually set in the context of those people giving sacrificially even though they had need. Do you follow what I'm saying? So we'd like to claim that promise, but we're like, I don't want to have to do that first part, so I'll just skip that because that's not fun and just go to the fun part. God's going to provide for me, and he always does. He always will. Well, actually, and I think I mentioned this at the offering a few weeks ago, there's a stipulation there. When you're in need, you can't just say, oh, well, God's going to take care of me. You also need to operate within his ways and within his kingdom to reap from his kingdom. Now, this isn't an offering speech, but I just want to point that out, that we take scriptures, we'll take them and isolate them out and be like, this is God's word to me. Well, what are you going to do if you're struggling with your boss or your spouse and you, come to, you just randomly do Bible roulette and you're like, and I will crush your enemies and pulverize them and put them like dust on the wind. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. No, are you kidding me? You can't do that. So I'm kind of making light, but some of us do this. Some of us do that because it's easier than actually spending time with God. But I want to call you up and say, friends, if we're going to be like Samuel in this generation, we need to know the voice of the Lord for ourselves. I mean, think about it, though. Who, who does he speak to? Well, he speaks to men. We see the, a biblical precedence there. Just pick one. God spoke to a lot of guys in the Bible. We see he spoke to women. Look at Deborah, man. She was on fire. This is the Old Testament. She's crushing people by the word of the Lord and going out and doing valiant things. He speaks to children and through children. I mean, he even says, I've ordained praise out of the mouths of children. He speaks to the elderly. There's no one disqualified. When Jesus was at the temple, there's this lady, Anna. God had spoken to her and given her a prophetic word as well. God wants to speak to everyone. Say it with me, everyone. Is it on the screen? Everybody. God wants to speak to everyone. Now, here's the crazy thing. In about 400 A.D., you guys want to get nerdy with me really quick? 400 A.D., Constantinople was there. I almost said it in Spanish. That's kind of fun. And, and listen, Constantine, he actually made Christianity the state religion of Rome. And for the very first time in 400-something years, it was possible to be a Christian by name only. You could be a lukewarm Christian. You could be a casual Christian because if you were Roman, you were Christian. Now, what started to happen is people noticed that a lot of people were Christians and they could pull this cool lever. If they pulled Christianity into the political arena, they could pull a lever of control over people. You see, human beings have this tendency to gather wealth and power unto themselves. And then they do anything they can, even if it's corrupt, to protect it. And this happened in this time. That the people who were in power decided to control who could have the word of God and who couldn't. Who could hear from God and who couldn't. Well, you know what's really bizarre is this was after Jesus. This was a time when what first Peter when Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, he says, yo, you guys are all a kingdom of priests and kings now. There is no need for the priesthood to hear on your behalf, and God is your king, the way it was meant to be. Each of you now can participate in going before the Lord and hearing his voice. That's why it was significant that the veil was torn between the holy of holies and everyone else. 
God was saying, I'm breaking out of here. I'm going to live in your midst like I've always wanted to. And now because of Jesus, I can. You see what I'm saying? Well, the leaders of the time were like, we're going to have to get control of these folks. So let's lift up the word of the Lord and let's elevate it to a place where normal folk don't feel qualified to do this type of thing. You know what this led to? The dark ages. When Christianity almost went extinct. Except for the Celts who held on to the sacred teachings and copied the Bible and knew the word of God and continued in their practices and eventually re-evangelized the entire continent of Europe twice. We see later as well, this was one of the things that motivated Luther to get so rowdy and so upset is that he, he went down to Italy and saw what was going on with the Pope and the leaders of the church, and he just went nuts. He's like, how could it be that we say people can't hear from God? How can it be that we say people can't read the word of God? This is ludicrous. It is not by works, it's by grace. Read the Bible. But they wouldn't let people read the Bible. You see, what's crazy is rich families started to pay cardinals to give their children positions in the Catholic Church. They didn't even know God because the church had become a political tool and a place of power and prominence and control. But you see, Jesus didn't pay for us to come into freedom so that we could go back into the bondage of religiosity and sin. No, he paid for us to be free and to have access to the Father, each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, to hear God's voice in community, submitted to one another and to the Lord. Another abuse that we see in hearing God's voice is not just the holding it up high, but using the whole God told me statement in dealing with other people. My favorite, when I was younger and in youth with a mission, people would say, well, God told me that I'm going to marry so-and-so. I'd be like, that's kind of funny because your breath is stinky. And I don't think that girl likes you very much at all. She's not into you. Well, God told me. I'd be like, well, don't tell her that. Five seconds later, what do I see happening? That dude telling that girl and that girl running for her life. <laughs> when Maritz and I were just friends, we liked each other, but we hadn't told each other yet because we we're both chicken. I had, I had a girl tell another girl, that she heard from God that I was her husband. I was like, well, that's weird. You hadn't told me anything. But we do this all the time. We, we take the voice of God and we use it as a lever against other people. Because how is someone supposed to refute what you're saying you heard from God? You see, it actually takes great maturity for us to hear something from God and then let that thing sit in God's hand for him to do that thing. Just because God speaks to you doesn't mean that you're meant to go then beat people over the head with it. And I believe that God's calling our church to be a church that hears him very, very well and very clearly. But we also exercise the discipline to not go out and just blab that at the first chance we get, especially if it means trying to manipulate or control someone into doing what we want them to do. See, here's the tricky thing about hearing God's voice sometimes. We're emotional people. We get attached to certain things. So then it's very easy to take our emotions, what our emotions are telling us, and believe that that is the voice of God. But I want to encourage you, a way to test that is to ask yourself, why is this important to me? Why is this important to God? And then ask that three or four times till you get down to the real reason. Because it might be that you're just nervous that that person's going to do something you don't want them to do. So because you love them, you'll use the God card on them and get them to stop. But you see, that actually shortcuts other people's growth as well as yours. Because God wants us to trust him just as much as he wants your kids or your friends to trust him as well. 
But here's another question for you. Isn't God silent sometimes? Is he really silent? As I was waking up this morning and seeing the sun come up, I felt like the Lord showed me, he, he said, he said, you know how the sun rotates around the earth? No, just kidding. I was just messing with you, making sure you're paying attention. The sun is always shining. It's not always light everywhere at once. You, you feel what I'm saying? You hear, you hear it? The sun is always shining. You cannot put it out. But it's not always light everywhere. I believe that God cycles us through seasons of silence at times. And there are good reasons for silence and there are not so good reasons for silence. You guys want to hear five? I promise I'll finish before 1.30, okay? <laughs> the number one reason, and these are not in any particular order, but just number one, okay? Number one is that you do not yet recognize God's voice. Similar to Samuel in verse, three of chapter, or verse 7 of chapter 3, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. That means you may need to practice hearing God's voice. If you're a new believer or you've been a believer for a long time and you don't regularly hear God's voice, I want to encourage you, God is always speaking. Always. He wants you to hear what he's thinking about and talking about. So we can learn to recognize the voice of God. But I'll tell you this, you will never know if that was God talking to you if you don't take action on it. If you're just like, well, I'm not really sure. I'm just going to wait and see what happens. And he's like, hey, I spoke to you so that you could move. And if you don't move, you're not going to know it was me. And then you're not going to know it was my voice. And the next time I speak to you, you're still not going to know. If you're a little freaked out to say, well, what did God say? You can always say, what do I think Jesus would say if he was here looking at this situation with us? That's one way of starting. And then you build your confidence as you step out in hearing the voice of God. But I want to encourage you, if you do not hear God's voice, take a chance with him this week. He wants to speak to you. And little kids in the room too, I see you. Yes, Davy's children, I see you too. God wants to speak to you. One of my favorite memories of God speaking to our family through one of our kids was when we were looking for a house. It's a house we bought nearby. I won't point in the exact direction so you don't come over for lunch this afternoon. But it, uh, we were going on the word of the Lord. It felt like he said, go buy a house. And I was like, Jesus, I really pray it has a tree house tree in it because that would be awesome. And uh, a fireplace. That's all I care about. I don't care about a roof. Just have fireplace and a tree house tree. It would be good to go. And we went and looked at this house. And as we were walking out, Seth said, I have faith for this house. That's all I said. We're walking across the grass back towards the house in the backyard. And sure enough, miracle of miracles, they chose our offer. And the lady at closing said, when you came to my door, because I had gone to the door like a creep saying, hey, when's your house going on sale? So when you came to my door, I felt like the Lord told me, this house is for that family. And there's more of the story, too long to tell today, but I was like, wow. And through my son, Seth, he gave us confidence like, God's in this thing. Go for it. You can practice hearing God's voice. The second reason God is, appears to be silent is this, that we have ignored his voice. In 1 Samuel 15, 10 through 23, I'm not going to read it all for you, it illustrates the story of when Saul yet again ignored the voice of God and did it his own way. And after this, he never heard the voice of God through Samuel again. In fact, at the end of his life, he went and consulted a witch to bring up the spirit of Samuel to ask him a question. That's in the Bible. That's kind of crazy. Because he had slipped so far away from where God had designed him to be. Started well, finished horribly. Jesus said in Matthew eleven fifteen, 15, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. 
Now, there's this crazy cool word in Hebrew called Shema, which means to hear and do. You see, we live in a Greek-influenced culture that very easily separates hearing and doing. We can hear something and be like, oh, now I know that, but never do it, and we're totally fine with that because we're Greek thinkers. We're about collecting knowledge, not experience. In fact, a Hebrew thinker would never say they knew something unless they had actually done it or experienced it. Like I could say, I know what it is to skydive, but I've never done it. But I know what it is. You know, you jump out of a plane, you scream and yell. You have these crazy goggles on so your eyes don't get sucked out of your head. And then you pull a chute and hopefully you don't die. That's skydiving. But I have no personal experience of that. But in our Western Greek-influenced, Greek-thinking-influenced culture, we're totally fine separating knowing from doing or knowing from experience. Because for us, it's about knowledge up here. See, but a Hebrew thinker would only keep, they would always keep hearing and doing together. And when they didn't, it was actually said of them that they did not hear the voice of God. They did not hear. And this is one of the keys for transformation as well. If you ignore his voice like you hear it but don't walk in it, do not expect transformation to come about in your life. Why? Because knowing something or believing it's true does not transform you. Walking in it does. Walking in it does. Do you hear what I'm saying today, church? Walking in the truth transforms who you are. I was talking with Alan this morning. It's like if you seriously know that your grass is burnt and dry and crispy this time of year, and I tell you, well, it's because you need to add a little bit of fertilizer and put some water on that thing, and you're like, that's good to know. But you never do it. What's going to happen? Crispy. Your grass is going to be crispy out there. Why? Because you knew something and you didn't do it. And I believe this is one of the greatest challenges for the church today is we are so just, we're consumers. Consume, here, 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 here. Listen, 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 listen. Gather, 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 gather. Do? What's that? I don't even know. And we do that with God all the time. He'll whisper something to you and you're like, cool, that's good to know. I'm going to keep treating my spouse poorly. That's good to know. I'm going to still keep, keep on like scamming the system and working the angles over here. Do you follow what I'm saying? I, I, this is going to be an encouraging message, maybe. <laughs> what happens, unfortunately, is number three comes about. We become hard-hearted. Hard-heartedness is another reason that we don't hear from God. Now, I don't know about you, but when you're not hearing from God, you're like trying to hear from God, and you're like, oh, please, Lord, as it lay me down to sleep. And he's like silent. Oftentimes we think it's because we've done something wrong. It's because we have a broken view of who God is and what he's like. We actually think he's like our earthly parents. So he's punishing us. He's withholding himself to punish us because we're bad people. But I would venture to say that this is true, that God will stop speaking oftentimes if we ignore him repeatedly and we continue in a pathway of sin he will hold off on speaking to us for a time, but maybe it's actually more like our hearts are so callous that we cannot receive the word of the Lord. Hebrews 3, 7 through 15, I'm only going to read a snippet of it though, says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. It is possible to harden your heart by ignoring the voice of the Lord. But here's the good news. If this is you, if you've been in a place where you've been ignoring God and he's telling you to do something, you're like, I'm too scared. I'm not going to do that. And now your relationship with him is suffering because you are callous. I'll tell you exactly what you can do. You want to hear it? Start obeying today. 
Start obeying. Don't reject the Lord. Start obeying right now. Because, here's the thing. Disobedience hardens the heart. Obedience produces sensitivity. Why? Because it tells God that you trust him. You can't have a relationship with God without trust. You got to have trust in there. Disobedience tells God, I don't trust you. You are not safe. Obedience tells God you trust him. Just like when Abraham went up and was going to sacrifice his son Isaac, the angel of the Lord said, now I know. Now I know what? Now I know that you fear God. Another way, interpretation, now I know that you trust and will obey. Now I know. You see, (laughs) when our hearts are hard, I'll tell you what it leads to. It actually leads toward a tendency to exalt the man or woman of God almost like the oracle. Now, I'm not disparaging the role of pastor or or prophet or teacher, but if you have an over-dependence on the man or woman of God to hear from God for you, I want to call you up and say there's a better way. It's called having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God wants to speak to you, directly to you. He wants to encourage you when you are discouraged. He wants to strengthen you when you are weak. God's word is creative power. Just like Pastor Nathan was talking about in worship, when God speaks, things are created. Things that were not come into existence. What else do you need? Do you really need the prophetess on TV to tell you that you're going to be okay? I mean, that's encouraging, but how much better for the Lord Almighty to break into your bedroom when you're weeping and saying, God, I don't know what to do. And he says, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. Whoa, like, man, that will strengthen your inner core. And you know what's cool about that? When the world sees that happening, they take notice. You're not just somebody who's over there rubbing the next cool YouTube video like a genie lamp. Give me a word, give me a word, give me a word. You're like, Jesus, you are my friend. You are my provider. Father God, you are going to take good care of me. Now speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. What do you want to say? Let him strengthen you in that place. Let him direct you. I dare you the next time you're faced with an opportunity to say, Jesus, what do you think about this? And then listen. And then do. Listen, if your heart is hard and you've drifted over towards over-exalting the man or woman of God to receive your word from that person, I want to encourage you that God wants you to collect it for yourself. He wants to speak directly to you. Now, here's the other thing that will also harden your heart is worshiping and idolizing past words of God and ignoring what he's saying in the present The spirit of religion, Lisa Bevere says, disparages what God is doing today while protecting and idolizing what God did yesterday. Hear me out. God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, he said, don't you dare store up that manna except for the Sabbath. It will spoil. I want to give you something fresh every day. God wants you to receive fresh from him today and tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. You guys hear what I'm saying? The fourth reason God can appear to be silent is this, that we have fear in our heart. Just like the Israelites did, they rejected the invitation of God to go meet with him at the mountain and said, Moses, you go instead. This is way too scary for us. Don't do this to God. He wants to meet with you. We also have fear about God, what God might say about the circumstance we're in or the situation we're contemplating or where we have been and what we have done. But I want to encourage you, don't be like Adam and Eve in the garden who hid and covered their shame and they tried to hide from God. God knew where they were. They didn't know where they were. God knows where you are already. 
So why does he want you to talk about what he already knows about? Because he wants to know that you want him to know about it, right? So don't be afraid to go and talk with him and listen. He's a good father. The fifth, the fifth reason God can appear silent is because he is testing you by the word. Psalm 105 summarizes beautifully the story of Joseph like this. He called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They attacked his, afflicted his feet with feathers, fetters, not feathers. They weren't tickling him to death. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. And he made him lord of his house over all of his possessions. Perceived silence is a chance to grow and mature and trust. Perceived silence, these times when God is not speaking to you, is your opportunity to say, I know what you have said and I am going to actively walk in it today. I am going to trust you that you are faithful, that you are true, that you are good. Why? Because I know that about you from your word and from what you've shown me through your faithfulness. I know this to be true about you. Instead of when you get into a season of silence and you're like, oh gosh, what did I do? Oh my gosh. Ah, and you start freaking out and you forget who God is. God is going to occasionally test you with silence because it is the mature disciple who can walk in the truth that they know about God and be okay with some silence once in a while. It puts your roots deep into what you already know. And I believe sometimes God gives an instruction and he withholds other instruction until you have learned to walk in that instruction he gave you. So don't jump to the conclusion if God is silent that you're just a bad person and he doesn't like you because that's not true. It could be true that you need to get some stuff right. But it could also be true that he's being quiet for other reasons as well. But no matter what the reason is, I want you to take courage in this. That the process of walking with God and learning to hear his voice and be obedient is a process of testing that produces endurance in you. In James chapter one, two through four, it says, consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfected and complete, lacking nothing. And this results in glory to God, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. And let, re let me remind you that just as Samuel was a person who listened and obeyed, God is calling us to listen and obey. And when we receive the words of God, we can be confident that what we speak, as they are the words of God, they will not return void. As it says in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, for the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is the word of the Lord for us today. You hear and receive the word of God. His words never fail. His truth over your family will never fail or go away. It will always bear the fruit of the kingdom in your life. Your job is to listen, obey, and speak the truth of who God is. Will you be a person who defends the honor of God with the way that you live and the way that you speak and the words that are on your mouth. I believe God is calling us into that place to serve this city, to serve your school, to serve your workplace. God is calling you out. He, Samuel, he set himself aside in a crooked generation to be a person that God could use. Set your, yourself aside and say, God, use me. 
That is the definition of holiness, friends. Unique and set apart for another purpose. God is holy. Be holy like he is holy. Be set apart like he is set apart. This generation wants to ruin you. The enemy behind you, behind that generation, wants to ruin you. Wake up, church. Let's be awake to the voice of the Lord. He wants to speak to you and speak through you the words of life. I'm telling you guys, mountains crumble at the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord shatters the cedars when he speaks. He makes the earth royal and come apart when God speaks. Remember Gideon? The warrior turned into a the warrior turned into a warrior by the word of the Lord. You as well, friends. Stop sitting on the sideline. God wants you to come forward and say, use me. Listen, this is not about you. It's not about how smart you are, how strong you are, how much Bible training you have, how few mistakes you've made, or how, be- how good you do at repenting and putting yourself on the floor before the Lord. This is about the Spirit of God wanting to use you. God wants to mobilize you into the area and place of influence he had placed you. Your job is to get close to him and practice hearing his voice. Because I'll tell you this, when you're in those moments of needing a word of the Lord to speak, you're going to be so glad that you've been hearing from God. Because we don't have anything to give that comes from us. It's from Jesus. Would you stand with me today? When you step into your position in the kingdom of God, you are literally doing a drop kick on the enemy's skull. You understand? Why? Because you are stepping into your position in Jesus Christ and the enemy is under his feet. So let's agree with the voice of the Lord this morning and step in. Step in. And I don't know who this is for this morning, but there, there are people in here saying, but, but I don't know how to do that. that I, I don't even know if I believe. I want to remind you of the guy who was talking to Jesus and he said, if you can, would you heal? And Jesus was like, if I can? If? And he said, I almost imagine this guy immediately being like, wrong word. Help my unbelief. I believe, but help it. Help my unbelief, please. And God said, you got it. Jesus said to him, you got it. Some of us need to do that today. We need to say, help me, God. Help me. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for these examples of what you're like and what you do and how you speak and your persistence at coming toward us and speaking with us and sharing with us the words of life. So I ask, Father, for this church family that you would bless us with a nearness of your presence and an awareness of your voice and courage to obey it and to live it out and to speak it out, God. Use us. We don't even know exactly how you want to use us all the time, but we know you want to. So we say, we're willing. Use us. Father, I pray that as people step into the word, that they would find transformation because they're putting feet, putting action to it, applying it to their lives, God. Teach us to be diligent to do that in the small things and in the big things, God. So we say thank you. So I pray for our friends today that you'd grant them courage in the spirit of Christ. Amen.